long did it take to make this? It was woven on a hand loom in the 17th century by a skilled silk weaver. He would have made five feet in a day. This machine can weave five feet in 15 minutes. That's progress in the silk industry, you might say. Well done. But this luxury, specialised fabric industry changed the world forever. How? Hanks of silk being dyed. Luxury, elegance and, let's face it, sheer snob value have driven the silk industry since its conception. Why bother wearing wool or linen when you can have silk? luxurious next to the skin and at the same time demonstrating how wealthy and sophisticated you are. It's a nice sauna, isn't it? Silk production is a slow, laborious process. It originated in China 4,000 years ago and it all begins with one of these, a silkworm cocoon. It's pretty much caterpillar spit that hardens in contact with air and we call it silk. Each cocoon is made of a single continuous thread up to half a mile in length and to unravel it we soak it in water. Amazing! To understand why the cocoons are so highly prized you have to look at silk close up. Rather beautiful isn't it? It's a prism. And when light hits a prism, it's broken into its constituent parts. That's why silk cloth has this beautiful sheen. It's refracted light. And these are the kind of fabrics you can make from it. Beautiful, aren't they? Look at the sheen. Very nice, tell your mother. People were prepared to pay huge amounts for this kind of beauty. They were worth their weight in gold, literally. And not surprisingly, China jealously guarded the secrets of silk production with the death penalty for hundreds of years. The story goes that Emperor Justinian employed two monks to smuggle mulberry leaves and silk cocoons out of China hidden in bamboo staffs. And around 550, the European silk industry sprang to life, creating sumptuous fabrics that only the most wealthy could afford. But a silk filament is too fine to be woven so it needs to be twisted to turn it into a thread. For centuries, this was done by hand. Until Italian Piedmontese weavers came up with this machine. And it looks really medieval, doesn't it? It's because it is. This outer frame stays still. The inner frame moves, and as it moves, it turns these bobbins. These bobbins contain the silk, and these swifts up here wind the twisted silk onto here. This technology was developed in the 13th century and remained a jealously guarded secret until the 17th. An English merchant, Thomas Long, sent his younger brother to spy on the Piedmontese silk throwers. And they opened in 1717 the first British factory for throwing silk. But three years after the mill was opened, John Long died in suspicious circumstances. Had the Piedmontese weavers exacted their revenge. After the yarn has been doubled, it has to be woven. On this, a loom. This is a very simple loom. Basically, these threads running up and down are called the warp. The thread I'm threading through, this one, between the warp threads is the weft. This loom works on exactly the same principle, only it's bigger and much faster. There are a lot more threads in the warp and they each pass through one of these. This little hole here in this piece of wire, a heddle which is held in this frame. So, by using foot pedals, you raise these heddles in the frame and create this gap, a shed, that the weft can be thrown through. So if you alternate them with your feet, each time passing the weft through, you're weaving. In 1733, John Kay invented the flying shuttle. It's got wheels. It flies across through the shed. 
carrying the weft here on its pern. So we can raise the shed and start to weave. Using this, a weaver could double his output. And if he changed colour of the threads in the warp, he could make stripes. But anything more complex, checks for example, you needed different coloured wefts. And to change wefts quickly, you use this, the drop box. The most skilful weavers were the Protestant Huguenots in Lyon in France. When they fled persecution in the late 17th century, they ended up here in Spitalfields, in London. Conditions were wretched, with a family to a room, and despite weaving a luxury item, these workers were paid a pittance, often working 16 hours a day to scratch a living. Silk became the fashionable fabric, still is. It was an absolute necessity for any lady or gentleman to be seen wearing silk. So demand for the fabric grew and production came out of the weavers' cottages in places like Spitalfields into buildings like this, this very handsome building at Wood Church in Hampshire. And its hand looms were in turn replaced by automated machinery. And the power source was this. This is a man-made channel and it leads directly to the water wheel. Look at all that lovely water pressure. And this is what converted that water pressure into usable power for the mill. A 12 horsepower recently refurbished water wheel. So the pressure of the water and the momentum and mass of the wheel itself provides the power to run the mill. Enough power to run 1,000 domestic light bulbs, which would be a pretty spectacular set of Christmas decorations, or all the machinery in this mill. So, lots of lovely power, but it needs to be constant and even. Otherwise, when you're weaving, your threads will be under different tensions. So the cloth will be uneven. So it's very important that this power is controllable. And you can't keep running outside and opening and closing the sluices. So that's where this comes in. It's a governor. The faster the wheel goes round, the faster these balls raise. And via interconnecting cranks and rods, they will open and close the sluice gates to make sure that the power to the wheel, the water power, is evenly delivered and the wheel revolves at a constant rate. Lovely. Production costs fell, and each silk worker now generated almost 30 times more income than a cotton worker. Not for themselves, of course, for the mill owner. All due to the wheel driving mill machinery through these belts and gears. This belt here is driving this machine. This is a bobbin winder. The silk arrives from the dyers on hanks. And this machine winds it onto bobbins. It's beautiful, isn't it? All that incredible brute force of the water wheel is transferred into this very delicate machine. See this gentle oscillation to make sure that the silk is wound evenly onto the bobbins. Pretty. Pretty. All these bobbins of silk are needed to make the warp, which once on the loom is threaded backwards and forwards by the weft. The warp is formed on this, the creel. There are 300 bobbins on here that we've just wound on the bobbin winder, but this one uh, takes over 500, so this is nowt then you can see how incredibly fine all this is. Each one of these threads goes through a reed. Here, threaded through. Then, we come this side, it's almost starting to look like a warp. All horizontal. All heading for further compression in another reed. This one is so fine, you actually need a hook, a reed hook, to pull each one through. The trick, of course, is getting the next adjacent one. If you think that's difficult, this final reed is in the same dimensions as that on the loom. Except on the loom, the reed is the width of the warp. That would be this wide. So what we have to do 
is wind this amount on the warping mill, 50 metres in this case, because that's the length of the warp, and then move on again. So in piecemeal, we create the true width of the warp. And you do this by engaging the machine. So, when you've got a full warp on this, 50 metres in length and 128 centimetres wide, that would be 323 miles of silk. And that's a heck of a lot of caterpillar spit. And once wound onto the warping mill, the warp is transferred onto the beam. And then the beam is lowered carefully through here because it's a bit difficult carrying 323 miles of silk down the stairs. And then it's onto the loom. This loom is powered by an electric motor, but it would have been the same principle if it was powered by the water wheel. It's a belt drive. Down here to this wheel, I turn to a central shaft. I connect here with these four wheels, the raise and lower, these cappy arms alternately, thus raising and lowering the shed. Sorry, the frames creating the shed. And there's another drive underneath connected to these two by cogs, obviously. And that knocks the shuttle backwards and forwards. So on one of these, you can do nine yards of fabric a day. And one weaver could look after six of these machines. That's a massive increase in productivity. Progress. But there was a problem. For any yarn, cotton, worsted or whatever, it's a very involved process to get the warp onto the loom. For silk, it's doubly so. It's so fine you can hardly see it. So once you've got the silk on the loom, you want it to earn as much money as possible. Now, these power looms could weave stripes or even checks if you had a drop box. These sold well, but the real money to be made in silk was with the aristocracy, who wanted to show off their wealth with phenomenally complex patterns. That, you still needed a very, very skilled handloom weaver. So, how to produce complex patterns on a power loom? The textile industry was being mechanised at pace. In a few short years, hand looms had given way to power looms. Weaving had moved out of the garret into factories. Wool and cotton mills were technologically innovative, but silk weaving remained virtually unchanged. These are silk pattern books. Silk is a very costly fabric for its purchasers. They wanted fabrics that would justify the expense. They would look complicated and difficult to work, as indeed they were. Only two inches of these silk velvets could be woven in a day by the most skilled weavers, bought perhaps by the fashion-conscious courtier at the Palace of Versailles. And this is how they did it, on a machine called a draw loom. This is not a draw loom, but this can demonstrate the principles. It took two persons to operate it, one man, worked the weft. The other person who operated this loom was a draw boy. He was up there and rest assured was most definitely a boy. What then happens is the draw boy can lift any combination whatsoever of warp threads purely by lifting them up in numbered sequences in cooperation with the weaver controlling the weft. You can do any kind of pattern as long as the draw boy is worth his salt can follow the weaver's instructions. But the conditions these boys worked in were horrific. Perched on top of a loom, cramped and uncomfortable, they had to lift 30 pounds at a time for shifts of up to six hours long. No wonder a Royal Commission set up to examine conditions found draw boys often fell ill. Were often crippled for life, more like. The other alternative was to print directly onto the fabric with a block. You'd build up the pattern by changing colour and removing or adding different parts of the pattern on the blocks. 
It wasn't quite the same. If you wanted the real thing, you had to pay for it. The trouble was for French weavers that nobody was paying for it. The French Revolution had put an end to royal excess. In fact, it put an end to royal everything. Silk was no longer politically correct and the silk industry failed in France. But when Napoleon crowned himself Emperor of France, silk was just the thing to demonstrate the taste and sophistication of his and Josephine's court. Napoleon had seen mechanization across other textile industries and believed that it would help to kickstart the silk industry. And with Joseph Marie Jacquard, he found just the man for the job. Jacquard, a weaver, had been a draw boy and had hated it and made it his life's work to automate the process. This is Jacquard's ingenious mechanism, and like all ingenious mechanisms, once you analyse it, the principles are simple. And you think, well, I could have done that. Well, of course you couldn't, otherwise you'd have a loom named after you. What happens is, every single warp thread has its lingo, its weight, and on this end, it has a hook. The whole thing suspended. This mechanism at the top is just a grill and it connects with every single hook and lifts it up. It's called the griff. So every time I depress this pedal, the griff rises. What it also does is turns this, and this contains the Jacquard punch card. What this is doing is giving information to the other part of the mechanism, the needle. The needle connects with the hook. It tells the hook whether it's lifted or not by the griff. So if there's a hole, the needle stays where it is and the hook is lifted. If there isn't a hole, the needle is pushed, deflects the hook and the warp thread stays down. It's a binary system, hooked or unhooked, up or down, on or off. And in 1801, Jacquard replaced the draw boy with this new mechanism. He could then use the mechanical loom to reproduce any pattern whatsoever. Only right fast. But not everyone loved it. French draw loom weavers smashed these newfangled devices. Jacquard was threatened with his life, but to no avail. By 1812 there were 11,000 Jacquard looms in France alone and they spread quickly. Here in Macclesfield the first Jacquards arrived in the 1820s. What had been created was the world's first programmable machine. In order to change the pattern, all you had to do was change the punch cards. But how did you make these punch cards? First of all, you reduce the design to its constituent parts, indicating on this graph paper whether there's a hole to be punched or not in the Jacquard card. And to accomplish that, Use this machine here. There are eight holes, eight fingers, you'll see. And there are eight buttons there. So reading from right to left, this card I'm going to punch for red here. Nothing in that one. So I leave it open. It's advanced one stop. Next one, five, 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 six, seven, eight. <laughs> six, wait a minute. Oh, that's it, eight. So, right, not very good. A proper card puncher would have worked at this speed. And once you'd punched these cards, you could just reproduce them. So any complex pattern could be woven on any number of looms. Brilliant. With the ability to now weave extravagant silks at speed, Mill owners realised the need for new patterns to keep up with demand. A subsidiary to the silk weaving industry developed, design. Design was so important that here in Macclesfield, a major silk producing area, local silk manufacturers contributed to the building of this, an art school, to properly train textile designers. And you can see how serious they were about it. Granite pillars, no expense spared. And it wasn't long before these Jacquard looms were hitched up to overhead shaft drives. So they were run by belts. 
And here they are, still working now. They would have been controlled by water or steam power, now they have electric motors bolted onto the side. But they're still the same looms. It doesn't make them work any more quickly, it just means they're a bit safer, because you haven't got great belts going up to the ceiling. So now, these looms could weave over 33 feet of fabric in a day, all controlled by punched cards. But the simple punched card went on to revolutionise much more than weaving. Because they didn't have to just store complex silk patterns, they could store numbers, for example. You could use them to input information into mechanical counting machines. And once you'd done that, you could also use them to control the machine itself, say all the inputted information needed to be added together. These cards could do that. And patterns are still created on looms in the same way today. A thread is either lifted to make the shed or not. But instead of having to punch cards from graph paper, we use one of these. A floppy disk. Now, work that would have taken three months to do on punch cards takes five minutes. So instead of producing yards and yards of these jacquard cards, it all goes onto floppy disk, which is used by this machine here, the rapier loom. Looks similar, I mean, there's the warp, the thread's there, but here is where it's different, because there's no shuffle. The weft is shot across by these two rapiers that meet in the middle. And there's no shuttle box. It's taken directly from here and cut each time as it goes through. Top speed is 600 picks a minute. That means the web crosses through the warp 600 times a minute, which would mean 125 metres of fabric a day. And up here, computer-controlled solenoids, hooking or unhooking each of the 5,000 warps not that different from Jacquard's original mechanism. And of course it's not just Jacquard looms that use the binary system. Every single computer in every home and every business uses it as well. Direct descendants of a loom patented in 1801. Permeates all our lives. Traffic lights, mobile phones, anything with a chip in it is a direct descendant of the Jacquard loom. All because kings and noblemen wanted to surround themselves with luxurious fabric. Those silkworms had no idea what they started. <laughs>